Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in ma ba'ad Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My name is Ilyas Abdul Haq Burnett Five and a half years ago or so I was known as Elliot Edward Burnett Subhanallah um, I like to begin usually with just a brief uh, and a background my mum is English and my dad is from Guyana. Do any of you know where Guyana is? Okay. Guyana is just above Brazil, between Suriname and Venezuela, but it's not like other Latin American countries, you know, it's considered the West Indies, so you have blacks there, Indians and Vietnamese people. Um, my father is obviously from the black side, yeah? And um, growing up, should I introduce you? Or do you want to introduce yourself? Don't mind. Uh, this, uh, this, this, introduce yourself. You know. This is my brother Jibril. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, as you can tell, we're twins. Yeah. And um, we grew up with our father. And funnily enough, our grandparents, neither of them, are, are, were religious. Not from my dad's side, not from my mom's side. And this is quite rare actually, uh, that generation were usually people who declared a faith even if they didn't go to church or anything, but our grandparents didn't declare any faith at all, and so our parents didn't have any faith of their own. Um, growing up, we never spoke about God, we were never taught about God, the only, the closest we ever got to any, anything like that was um, nature documentaries, at least for myself. You know, growing up I loved watching nat nature documentaries, really um, just amazed me the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I guess this was my kind of insight into the greatness of, of Allah. So having no religious influence at all, I grew up believing that religion in itself was a very strange concept to me. Whoever's phone that is inshallah, put your phones are silent inshallah ta'ala, please jazakallah khair. Um, yeah, religion was a strange concept to me. Uh, growing up again, looking at the creation, I believed in the Creator. I, have any of you seen our talk on Roadside to Islam? Show of hands. Islam, by the way. Yeah, um, Well, you know that Abu Bakr put atheists except Islam, whatever. We weren't atheists. Yeah, I don't even believe in atheism. I don't believe in atheism. We were agnostic, we were people who believed in the Creator, but we didn't believe in religion, yeah? So, I remember, I probably had a few encounters like this when I got like a bad letter from school or something, where I'm like praying to, to God or to, you know, to Allah, not to let that letter reach home or whatever. But um, I remember we, me and my brother, we, we went down to the park and we were just chilling and there was a young, young boy, I was about 10 at the time, and the boy was about seven, six years old. And, you know, he, he had behavioral issues. I know that now, he definitely had behavioral issues because I was a stranger to him and he was kicking me and just cussing me out. And this guy didn't even know me, didn't even know who I was. But his sister, his sister said that he, had, he, was, he was a cancer patient, which is a lie, I don't believe that this was true. The boy was very young. Yeah, to be a cancer patient, but she must have said this so that I would show some kind of mercy towards him because he does have behavioural issues and he probably doesn't go out much. <clears throat> so he pushed it a bit too far and I slapped him and uh, he obviously started crying because he was a young boy and I felt bad because his sister and her friend just turned on me and everybody's telling me I'm a bully and everybody's saying this, that and the other. So I left in tears and um, as I was making my way up to exit, exit the park, I remember, subhanAllah, I remember getting on my knees. I got on my knees and, and, um, and I literally, I made it still far, I made Tawbah. I remember asking God, at the time I would have said God, I, would, I remember asking him to forgive me for harming the boy and for, for upsetting his sister. And then I left. It's really strange when I think about it now. But I did do that, and I, I have a strong recollection of that. I always ask my brother, do you remember seeing me do that? He says, oh God, I don't know, but I remember it very, very well. So anyway, I know it's late, and after Isha, the sun is everybody to go home and rest, and they commit the Fajr Salah, so I'm going to keep this quite short. I'm going to jump to straight when I was 17. 
When I was 17, I was seeing somebody whose father was a Muslim, but his wife wasn't, and the children grew up non-Muslim. And I was seeing her, and I was at her house, and her father brought me into the kitchen to speak to him about, he wanted to talk to me anyway. And he spoke to me about Islam. And I just remember the emotions I felt when he was telling me about this theme. Because, like I said, religion was a strange concept to me. Christianity was something from afar. I could never understand the belief concept of Christianity. It always confused me. Jesus, God, they're the same. But then Jesus is Jesus. You've even titled him Jesus. And then God is God. You've titled him God. And then they're just, I always imagine God is the creator. But it was just very confusing. And he told me about a religion whereby the, the person worships God alone, the creator. He sends prophets and messengers to guide mankind. Uh, that made sense to me. Because if somebody's going to show you how to worship God, it has to be some, a human being, right? It has to be somebody, right? Otherwise, everybody would be making up their own way. <laughs> told me about the Holy Scriptures. Told me about Jesus and Asa, and that we believe in him, etc. But that he's, um, he's a prophet. He's not the son of, son of Allah. That made sense to me too. So I was blown away thinking, wow, there's actually a religion that I can actually relate to. <coughs> that just shocked me. Because everything that he was saying to me, my heart was affirming it. Every single thing he would say, my heart was saying, yeah, I agree with that. That makes sense. That makes sense. And that was really strange to me. And that, uh, yeah, yeah. So I remember leaving that night and the best way to put it was like it was a seed that was planted in the earth. That one conversation he had with me and then from that one conversation, whenever I'd meet Muslims throughout my work or whatever, if I'd, I'd always ask them about Islam just to try and get a little something, it's the same kind of feeling I got when he spoke to me about it. And um, it got to the point where I met somebody called Pasha, a good friend of mine, non-practicing Muslim, and he taught me Wabu taught me assalamu alaikum. He showed me the film The Message. You've all seen the film The Message. You've probably heard of it. Yeah, it's a decent film. It's not bad. Uh, I remember we was chilling, and he said um, you were watching it, and I said ah, oh. I hadn't even become a Muslim yet. Yeah, it's like ah, oh. I wish I could have been Ali, and I could have been in the bed while the Messenger of Allah escaped to make to make his hijrah. Subhanallah, I wasn't even Muslim yet, and I said I wanted to be Ali so the Messenger of Allah could escape. So it's like the love for Islam is definitely entering my heart bit by bit. And then I was with my mum and I told her that I want to read the Quran randomly. I don't often open up to my mum like that. Yeah, like if she asks me a question, I'll answer it and I'll talk to her a little bit. But I don't usually open up to her about my personal issues. But this time I just felt compelled to just tell her. Maybe because my brother wasn't there. It was just me and my mum that time. And she said, go into that cupboard there, I've got one. My mum, not Muslim, not Christian, nothing. She has a Quran. Allah knows how long she had it for. <clears throat> so I was like, mum, you understand what I'm asking for is a Quran, yeah? The Quran. She's like, yeah, I've got one. I was like, all right, cool, where is it? She said, it's in that cupboard there. So I looked in and sure enough, she has a Quran. So I asked her if I can take it. She says, yes, you can have it, but you have to, you know, respect it, don't lose it, this, that, and the other. It was given to me by one of her ex-boyfriend's friends, yeah? Because apparently her ex-boyfriend was a Muslim. He's off the deen now, may Allah guide him. Um, but anyway, so I took that Quran, the interpretation in English, and I just read it, just bit by bit, step by step, a gradual process. And sometimes I leave it alone, sometimes I read a page, sometimes three. But the thing that amazed me the most was, uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends verses in, in the Quran with his names and qualities. For example, wa huwa al-aziz al-hakim, wa huwa al-ghafur al-rahim. You know, when I, when I think of God, I believe in him having these qualities. He is the almighty. He is the all-seeing. He is the all-knowing. So to read, in a, to read in a book that this person, or this, this the, he's telling me who he is, and these are qualities that no man can have, no man can be all seeing. So he's like telling me, he's like showing me like, Ilyas, I am who you envisioned I'd always be. <coughs> and and that, 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 really, that really touched me. You know, he's, he's, he's telling me he's almighty, he's telling me he's the all-knowing, he's the all-wise. And then I'm looking at these verses and he's talking about, because I started from Baqarah, 
So, so from being from not even being a Muslim and looking into the deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks a lot about the munafiqeen. He talks about those who claim to have faith, but they don't really have faith. So for me being in the middle path where I'm not sure, I'm not, my iman isn't certified yet, I'm looking into the religion, I'm hearing about these munafiqeen, I'm thinking, is that me? Am I, am I, am I that munafiq? It's just like, you know, saying I believe, but then I don't believe none. But I kept on reading. And then in that, I got, a, I got a lot of historical lessons as well, because I was always aware of Christianity, and I was always aware of the falsehood in it, Judaism I was always very much a stranger to, but Allah SWT spoke, speaks and teaches me about how the Christians deviated. And that was, that was amazing as well because I'm, I'm, I'm being shown that this way, this religion is true, and as much as we acknowledge Christianity, it exists, it's there, it's present, we have many churches in this country, we have many people who believe in Christianity, but I never believed in it, and Allah is showing me the falsehood inside of it as well. And it's all making sense. And then he speaks about the creation, about how we, you know, created all of these things for our benefit. And there's just nothing you can deny about it. When you look in, I, I advise each and every single one of you to read the interpretation of the Quran in a, in a language you understand. If you don't have Lukatul al Arabiyata, if you don't have Arabic, read the, the Quran in, in, a, in a language that you understand. Because you'll take a lot of great benefit from it. The Quran in its English, the interpretation of the Quran was enough for me to accept the religion. Because reading the Quran is what ultimately led me to take my shahada. So even the interpretation in itself is, is, is strong and, and like no other thing. So it got to the point where I think I'd gotten into a couple of pages into Ali Imran and I was just... Honestly, brothers, Islam is something you either accept it or you reject it. But there's no doubting in it. There's no doubting in it. If you read the, you read the interpretation of the Quran, you get a little bit of Islamic knowledge, you can't deny the truth in it. The only thing you can do is reject it or accept it. It's really that simple. Some people might reject it because they have a partner who would, they fear they'd lose if they accepted Islam. Other people, they fear maybe their, their parents' reaction or how society will view them. Or it's a, it's, you know, there's types of kufr. There's kufr of pride, there's kufr of arrogance, there's kufr of doubt, etc. Well, more often than not, people that have been exposed to Islam as it is, it's usually kufr of arrogance and pride. So, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened my heart not to be proud, uh, not to be afraid of the changes that I'd make in my life, because I was actually looking forward to changing my life. I knew I needed it. I was looking forward to a change. So, I spoke to a friend of mine. He advised me to go to this masjid, uh, to a masjid and take masjid. I remember, you know when you walk into a building, you never look down. You never really think to look down. So, I had my trainers on. And the first thing I did was just walk into the masjid with my trainers on. And uh, there was like three uncles stood by a pillar, they're like, what are you doing? I go, what are you doing? I was like, what? <laughs> they're like, you're in the masjid. So I'm like, yeah. They're like, there's carpet in here. And then I looked down and I noticed they ain't got shoes on, they're barefoot, they got socks on. So I'm like, okay, cool, sorry about that, sorry, sorry. So I took my shoes, I put them down, I sat in the corner, they said, what are you here for? I said, I, said, I want to take my shahada. I said, okay. So who do you want to see? I said, Can I, you should see the Imam. One of the brothers said, I said, okay, cool. Just wait here for a moment. So they went to speak to the, to speak to the Imam. I went into the office. He asked me a little bit about the religion. And that made me nervous. He said, why, did you, why do you want to be Muslim? That made me nervous. Because I knew I wanted to be a Muslim, yeah? But he was testing, like, why? Like, my Islamic knowledge, so to speak. So it made me a little bit nervous, actually. Because I didn't know anything about the message of Allah. I just knew that Islam was a true religion. I looked into the Quran. I... I read, you know, Baqarah and a little bit of Ali Imran, I was just new. I didn't really know how to answer him. I was like, I know this is the true religion. I believe that God is one and this is why I want to accept Islam. He said, what's your name? I said, my name's Elliot. He said, you should take the name Ilyas. I was like, it's funny you said that because a couple of days ago, there's a guy in my area I speak to. I told him I was looking into Islam. He asked me what my name was. And he said, I should take the name Ilyas too. So there's only two people before I accepted Islam who advised me to take a name and both of them said one of the rarest names that I used. Alhamdulillah, Nabi Ilyas alayhi salam. So that was it. I took my shahada. Uh, from that point on, I never looked back. You know, I really progressed a lot in the deen when I, when I took my shahada. I remember one of the first things I got was the Moroccan phobe. You know, I was like, I was going all out. All out. I had a picky afro and cut my hair. My beard was coming through bit by bit. And uh, oh, don't forget the socks and the sandals, bro. Yeah, 
that's socks awesome. and sandals. I'm gonna leave that right now. <laughs> yeah, socks and sandals. I was going in. I remember. I remember like my second drum. I came down. Came downstairs from my block, and my Jamaican neighbour lives on the other side. His little son. His little boy was there. And he said, "Look, Daddy, it's Jesus. <laughs> it's Jesus." And I was like, "No, no, no, not Jesus." <laughs> Subhanallah. My face must have been blowing then. Now, nowadays, people tell me I look tired. That's what I was telling my brother. And too much, man. Too much. I, I, I miss those days, you know, when I was so full of, so full of zeal and so devoted. Subhanallah. At the same time, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has blessed me with uh, with much khair since accepting Islam. I uh, I've travelled to Misr. I went to Egypt for a year and a half. I studied Arabic for a little while. <coughs> And um, that was a great experience for me, you know, I've memorized portions of the Qur'an. I've e I even teach Tajweed as well, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, I progressed a lot when I came into the deen. And um, if I was going to give anybody an advice, I would just say to remember death often. Um, I actually tweeted recently, if anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, you can at poetry for Islam. Poetry for Islam or at Ilyas Burnett, that's I L I Y A S. But I tweeted recently, I just said, What did I say? I said, um, Like, too many of us are playing the role of fitna in one another's lives. Like, as brothers and sisters, we should support one another. And I just, yeah, like, we do, like too many of us are playing the role of fitna in people's lives, man. We need to just leave people alone. If we don't have, it, if we don't have any khair with somebody, if we don't have no intention of goodness, just let that individual be. Just put them to the side, man. Let them get on with their lives and you focus on what you need to focus on. Don't drag somebody down with you. Don't try it and invite another Muslim into haram. Because I, because, uh, I was thinking that, you know, imagine like you, you get into haram with, with a sister, for example, yeah? And then, like, at some point in your life, Allah's gonna tell her, gives you the tawfiq to make a sincere tawbah. A sincere tawbah. So Allah's gonna tell her, gives that sin. But then on the day of judgment, you find that sister and you see her being thrown into the hellfire because of an action you coerced her into, you encouraged her into, because she didn't make the toba. Allah gave you the benefit to make the toba, but you brought her into an action that caused her to fall into the hellfire. So what I'm saying is, as brothers and sisters, we just need to fear our last final time and remember death often and don't be in one another's lives unless we're calling one another to goodness. And alhamdulillah, this is my story, it's very, very, kept it very blunt, very short. But ultimately, the praise and the thanks is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding me and for guiding my brother. For surely, those who, are, those who Allah has chose, chosen to be left in misguidance, none can guide them. And truly, whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to guide, then that person will be guided for sure, without doubt. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on a straight path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to make us meet him in the best state. I know what I mean, in sujood, fasting, on the way to the masjid, in the masjid, just any state of khair, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us in it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Jibreel Much. Was um, due to the assistance of my brother Ilyas. Alhamdulillah, Allah uses his slaves however he was. And um, it's very interesting when I listen to my brother's story because he freestyles and I freestyle. We don't write or prepare anything. So normally when I listen to him, I learn something new or he, he, he um, tells his story from another perspective. But I just find it very interesting how from how Allah's mercy and his qadr is that he can guide people from a haram circumstance. Like a circumstance that is not of any khair at all in any way, shape or form. And Allah turns that from his mercy into goodness. Alhamdulillah, Allah is great. So, um, I lived in a hostel when I was 16 years old. Um, I have a good relationship with my family, with my mum and my dad. However, with my dad we would have ups and downs and I'd get kicked out very often. Same as my brother as well, actually. He had his own place at 16, 17, and I moved into the hostel when I was like 16. But I remember me speaking to these two girls in the hostel and we was discussing faith, we was discussing religion and they um, had became born again Christians um, and we was discussing God and the devil etc 
and what they had to say really affected me um, in terms of just recognising God. We didn't speak so much so about Jesus and is he God or is he not God? Is he God or was he sent by God? Um, but just at the time I felt perhaps that I needed God in my life. I always recognised that there was one creator. And at that instance, in, in, during that conversation, I decided that I'd become a Christian. However, uh, if, if a Christian was watching this, then they would probably say that I wasn't a Christian because I never believed that Jesus was the son of God or God himself. In fact, actually, before I accepted Islam, <clears throat> before I knew anything about Tawheed, um, I would be trying to pray. And the way that Christians teach you to pray is that you say, in Jesus' name we pray. Sort of look at him as like a, an intercessor, like a, a mediator, an, in, an intermediary between you and Allah. Because in the Bible it says, um, um, The only way unto God is free me, something like that. Yeah. I am the way, the truth, and the light. And nobody shall, shall come to the Father except through me. So, um, they kind of, because of that verse, they consider that, that gee, they have to go through Jesus in order to get to God. Um, but I would remember making a prayer, which was more like a dua, in my room, and getting to that last point in the prayer where I'm supposed to say, in Jesus' name we pray. But like a sense of fear would overcome me. Like, I feel like I'm speaking to God. I feel like I'm speaking to the Creator, the all hearer, the all seer, and Mujib, the swift in response. So, why am I saying in Jesus' name? And I was very concerned as to whether or not my salah or my, my dua would be accepted because I would consciously leave that part out. I had a, I had a, my, my fitrah, my natural disposition allowed me to recognise that Allah is one and I can speak to him directly and I don't need to have any intermediary between, uh, between me and him. <clears throat> like the Catholics, it's a strange thing. <clears throat> me and Elias were speaking about it the other day. An individual will go into a box while a, a man sits next to him and confesses his sins. And you know, a man confessing his sins to a sinner and expecting that sinner to be able to forgive him for his sins. As if this individual is, is al ghafur or rahim like he is a tawab. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So, this lifestyle of Christianity was on me for about two weeks. Um, due to the nature of how that religion works, it doesn't really become a part of your life. You go to church on Sunday, and um, really and truly from Monday to Saturday, you're just kind of doing whatever you want, really and truly. Um, and I don't think that this, uh, I don't think there's a lot of wisdom in this, I don't think it's sustainable, and I think that's why today a lot of the churches are empty. I know the Masajid are full, and Christianity has is, is, is got to the state that it's in, um, just because of the fact that it's not really a lifestyle. So um, after two weeks I, I left it, I was like, no, this doesn't really make any sense. I don't understand who you guys think Jesus is or why you think Jesus is that. Um, I do remember coming across a very interesting verse in the Bible, though, which I'll mention now, where it says that, and he, Jesus, went a little further and fell on his face, praying, saying, oh, my Father, let this trial pass for me, not as I will, but as you will. So firstly, it's important to recognise that Isa, alayhi salam, would make sujood like the Muslims make sujood. He wouldn't be standing and clapping and singing and hollering. He would make sujood in humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the Muslims do. Rather, the Muslims love Jesus, alayhi salam, Isa, alayhi salam, more than the Christians do in reality. And um, another interesting verse in the Bible as well, which is amazing. I don't think a lot of you guys will be aware of this. The only reason I know is because um, I set up a Dawah project with Rafiq and Naeem and some of the brothers from, from Tottenham Seven Sisters. And in doing that, we had regular meetings once a week where we learned and studied different verses from the Bible or, or how to tackle atheists and scientists. And I came across a very interesting verse, subhanAllah, you won't believe it, but it says in the Bible, in chapter 29, verse 12, in Isaiah, the book will be revealed to him who is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he will say, I am not learned. SubhanAllah, who knew that? Who knew that was in the, in, in the Bible? Amazing, SubhanAllah, because we know from the life of Rasulullah wasallam that he was not learned, he couldn't read or write. And the angel Jibreel alayhi salam came and said, Iqra, read. And he said, Ma'ala bi qari. You know, the, 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 
the, the, the perfection in, 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 the, in the Prophet's character, subhanAllah, even that he would have the honesty to say that I, I, I can't read. He was not like a proud man, subhanAllah, he was amazing, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the angel um, Jibreel held him tightly and get, again and said, Iqra, read. And he said, Man Abi Qari. So he fulfills that prophecy. The book will be revealed to him who is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he will say, I am not learned. If that's not down for a Christian, subhanAllah, I don't know where it is. But alhamdulillah, they pick and choose what they want. <laughs> or they say, You're going in the wrong context. Alhamdulillah. It's like Ilya said, You either accept it or you reject it, but you cannot deny Islam. I love that, mashallah. It's very true. Very, very true. So, after these two weeks of, of trying to be a Christian, I, I let that go because it, it didn't appeal to my fitra and it was not sustainable. And um, I, I came back on my 21st birthday. I was celebrating in Manchester with a few friends. I came back to my mum's, as was our sunnah. We would, on a Sunday, we would always go to our mum's because it was my dad that raised me and my brother as a single parent. And um, I see Elias rolling, afro, beard, the Moroccan thobe, the sandals and the socks. I'm thinking, because me and my brother have a strange relationship, we're very close, we're closer now. But back then we was a bit, I don't know, we would go for quite some, some time not seeing each other, am I right? Yeah, we went, we went to, like our dad wanted us to go to different schools from year five. Mm. So from the, like the last year of primary school, my brother was in a different school. And then through secondary, we went. We were at different secondary schools and college as well. And listen, don't hijack my talk, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really loud. Just joking, man. Um, but it's true. My dad did want us to have separate identities. So he's from year five. I think me and him was getting into too much trouble together as well, really and truly. We was that public enemy number one. Um, we used to terrorise people in school and get terrorised for it. Um, so yeah, so secondary school was completely different, had completely different friends, completely different identities. Yeah, but we were still very close. So he comes into my mum's, I see him looking very strange to me. So I'm like, what's going on? And he says, you know what, he's a Muslim. I didn't know what a Muslim really was or what Islam really was. Um, and this is where the journey really began. And he took a very, do you know what? Allah blessed him, subhanAllah, because I would hold some very, very difficult, controversial questions at him. Why is it that, that um, um, Muslim men can marry more than one wife? Um, do you really believe that Adam and Eve were the first of creation? SubhanAllah, at the time I remember that the, com the conviction, that the, the certainty I had that that was not a reality, it was crazy, it was so real to me. And when he said, yes, I do believe that, I thought it was crazy. But now, I believe it with absolute yaqeen, absolute certainty that, that Adam and Huwa were the first of creation. And this is from the Rahmah of Allah. But in any case, he would answer these questions in a very, very good way. In a way that was clinical, in a way that was... He didn't stutter, he was very direct, he was very straight. And because we were in a debate, and because I was jahil, I would pretend like, like his points didn't make sense, or I'd pretend like that didn't affect me, but his answers really did make sense. Islam made sense. Or at least in those controversial topics it made sense. So what he would do is I'd be chilling in my flat, listening to music, and then I'd get a message saying I'll listen to Matad Khan, Deceptions of Shaitan, for example. And um, I would listen to it. So I'd put the music on pause, I would open up the Matad Khan talk, and I would start listening. If it doesn't catch my interest in the first five minutes, I might pause the video and then go back to the music video that I was just watching. But then there's such a huge like, uh, contrast like, between the two. Even if, if it didn't gauge your interest quickly, you're going from listening to something about Allah and, and, and Islam, which is a pure thing, and shaitan, and then you go to a music video and you're seeing all sorts of indecency on there. Something, it kind of tells your heart that something's not right here. So I would actually close a video and force myself to listen to this talk. And I enjoyed them, I loved them. Said Raga's talk on um, the, the descriptions of paradise was, was a beautiful talk, Ahmed Dida. And slowly but surely, I was able to gain an understanding of how shaitan works, even though I wasn't a Muslim. Um, I was able to gain an understanding of Islam. And it's like I, I heard Mufti Meng say the other day, um, that you can't, like, what's not to like about Islam, really and truly? Like, where's the risk element in it? 
Where's the risk element in worshipping Allah alone? There's no risk. How can somebody say that's wrong for, for worshipping the Creator? But there's risk involved when you start worshipping man, someone who gets tired, someone who sleeps, someone who supposedly died, and you say it's God. There's, there's, an, um, there's a danger in worshipping stones. You know, there's a danger in, in, in all of these things, in atheism. So what, so let's say for example, um, an atheist might say, well, don't you worry that there is no God. And that when you die, all of your withholding from your desires was a waste of time. Yeah? And I'll say, okay, let's say for example, that's a possibility. We know it's not, but let's say it's a possibility. So I live my life happy and content because I believed with absolute certainty that I was doing the right thing. I abstained from certain false attractions and I lived a life of, of contentment because that's what Islam gives you. Even though we give up a lot of haram, you know, we, we, we feel the sense of contentment being Muslims, right? Definitely, 100% we do. Because only in the rem remembrance of Allah do the hearts find peace. Allah is as salam, He is the owner of peace. So you cannot attain peace, true peace, without worshipping the, the owner of peace. So, fair enough, I live my life contentfully and at the end I just die and worms eat me, as my sister used to say, and that's it, nothing after that. But let's say you're wrong. Let's say if you're wrong, and there is a God, and there is a young Qiyama, what's going to happen for you? It's peak. So, we're in a win-win situation. So, these talks, I loved them, I benefited from them. Um, there was two girls that I was seeing at the time as well um, and I told one of them that I was looking to accept Islam and she was like, are you going to grow your beard? That was the first question she asked me, subhanAllah. Are you going to grow your beard? And I was like, um, I'm not sure, I heard it's not an obligation, this, that and the third. And then my brother played an interesting trick on me. He said to me that the Imam has invited you to the masjid, so he made it sound extremely personal that the Imam has specifically asked right. for me. You keep saying that. The Imam knew I was a twin, and he, it was a community day, and the Imam said, make sure your brother comes. It's true, honestly. He wanted you to come. Alhamdulillah, I had an invitation to come to the masjid. Yeah. <laughs> you and mom, you and mom. And, um, I, because of watching Mutaza Khan's talk on the deceptions of Shaitan, I had certainty that something was going to try and prevent me from attending this talk. To this question, to listen to this talk. And that increased me in certainty that yes, definitely, I, you know, um, I think that this is the, the true religion. So I said, Alhamdulillah, I'm going to go. So I went to Lewisham, I listened to many brothers speak, speaking to me, giving me dawah, etc. And one of them said something which which you might think is trivial, but for me, it, it, it really struck a chord. He said, because I asked him about the beard, right, because I was interested in this, and I asked him if, if it was worship, like, if I had to have it. And he said, imagine if you saw a lion in a safari, and it had no mane. Wouldn't it look like a lioness? And then I stopped, and I was like, damn, you're right. It would look like a lioness. And then from that moment on, I was like, okay, alhamdulillah, if I accept Islam, I'm definitely growing a beard. 100%, 100%. 100%. We don't believe in zodiac signs, but I'm, I'm a Leo as well. So being a lion, you know, I was, it, really, it, really, uh, it really got me uh, uh, excited about that and making me feel like I want to implement that sunnah, alhamdulillah. But I had certainty that Islam was true, but I didn't want to get caught up in the emotions. You know, like you, you're having loads of brothers speaking to you, you're feeling away. And you're like, you know what, my brother was on my case as well, take your shahada, you know, you believe it's the truth, take your shahada. And I was like, you know what, let me see how I feel in the morning. If I feel the same way, if I still feel that same conviction in the morning, then I'll definitely come to the masjid and take my shahada. Because you know how it is, you know when you go to a talk, an Islamic lecture, and subhanAllah, the imam or the sheikh has really got you feeling like, on top of the world, somehow like you're gonna do this and you're gonna do that, and then you wake up in the morning and the feeling is just gone like that. And you're back to your old ways. All those things you thought you was gonna do, you don't do them. So I thought perhaps maybe this is the case with me. I'm feeling like yes, I'm ready to do this, and then I wake up in the morning, I'm like I made a mistake. So alhamdulillah, I was able to wrestle away from the circle of brothers around me telling me to take my shahada, because <laughs> it was literally like a circle of brothers like take your shahada. I said, like, nah. 
if I feel the same way in the morning, I'm coming to the mashing. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me life. Because really, I, I, there was no guarantee I was going to make it up the next morning. And this is why they were so on me to take my shahada. And I understand that, of course. But I woke up in the morning with the same conviction. I went to the Asian Islamic Centre and I took my shahada. Alhamdulillah, I accepted Islam. And, um, you know, uh, like Ilya said, you know, we never looked back. You know, ever since I learned how to pray, pray five times a day. It's, you have to make it part of your lifestyle. You just have to, because people build up habits in their life if we're late. You build a habit of being late, you'll always be late. You know, if you're, if you're someone who likes to stay fit, you make gym part of your lifestyle and it becomes easy. Same for a Muslim. You make Salah five times a day part of your lifestyle. If I'm going to do something or I've got a day ahead of me, I, in your mind you, you calculate when your prayer is and you just know. You just, it's just part of your lifestyle. So my advice for the brothers is, that especially for new Muslims as well, because brothers who have been Muslims for a long time and practicing, alhamdulillah, I'm sure they don't struggle with these things, but for people who are new to the deen or might be struggling to pray five times a day, you have to be conscious of the fact that if you know Islam is a reality, then you know that you have to go to war with yourself to get yourself to a point where these things become easy. You just have to. Because I knew that when I accept, when I took my shahada again from the Masaz al Khan to perceptions of Shaitan, I knew that after that Shaitan was going to come with all sorts of tests. Like for example, I had an eight all day. When I was at that um, community day in the in Lewisham Islamic Centre, I had an eight because I was so engrossed in discussion. So I said, when I get back to my stepmoms, I'm sure it's going to be pork on the plate. I'm not saying I know the faith, by the way. I'm really not saying this, but these are just you know, things that I thought would be the case, and they were the case, pork on the plate, what am I going to do, am I hungry, I've just, I'm, you know, I think Islam is a truth, am I going to go and eat a pork, no, I'm just going to let it go, oh, I know that a girl's going to message me from out of the blue randomly, can I come over, I'm chilling by myself alone, what do I get, a text message, oh, can I come over, then I, I entertained the discussion for a period of time, and I'm saying to myself, you you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're playing with fire here, but I'm entertaining discussion a little bit, and then I get to the point where I remember a hadith about the, the ten under the shade of Allah. One who is offered the chance to commit zina. I think the woman has to be of a certain status though, and she was certainly not of that kind of status. <laughs> but, but you have to be of a certain status and you say, I fear Allah. This time I'm new to Islam, Isaiah is there. Do you know what I wrote back in capital letters? I fear Allah in the text message. SubhanAllah, because I thought I want to be under Allah's shade. May Allah give him shade on the piano. I mean, alhamdulillah. But I knew that I had to even though I was maybe to an extent lonely or might have enjoyed our company, I knew that if I make that decision and, and I don't give up on certain things now, then I'm always going to compromise. And I'm always going to be shaky. So you have to really, when you, you start Islam, you have to make sure you're shadeed on yourself, you're very strong and, and firm. And alhamdulillah, this is it. Barakallahu feet. Brothers, the brother's question was, <clears throat> he asked, when people, you know, accept Islam, you know, sometimes the Islamic community doesn't fully embrace them, or perhaps maybe there's a culture difference because of maybe their nationality, etc. And some of the, the masajid can be very much one kind of nationality based. Um, so how do we challenge that, and what steps did me and my brother take in order to, to you know, integrate into the Muslim community? And like my brother said, you know, a masjid which has many different nationalities of people is the most Islamic masjid you'll ever find because the deen is for every, every human being from every different nationality and yes we should be warm towards one another we should observe the character of the messenger of Allah in that greeting those you know and those you don't know at the same time there's a responsibility upon the reaver upon the Muslim to force himself to integrate you know, sometimes when people accept Islam, they keep the same jahil friends. And this is a big problem. When people accept Islam, they keep the same group of friends. So, one, they're not gaining their Islamic Muslim friends. Two, they're, they're harming themselves because they're remaining with people that aren't encouraging them to pray, they're not encouraging them to learn, and so they just end up dragging them down and they end up drifting. So, the Muslim has to take responsibility for himself, the community has to be warm towards one another, greet one another, 
and um, and yeah, like my brother said, we were very fortunate enough to have a masjid which is very river orientated, very mi a large mix of nationalities, and uh, I would actually consider myself quite antisocial uh, in some in some senses, but I, I was committed to the masjid, so I was in the masjid often, and in that I got to meet lots of different brothers and. Being a revert, actually, they, they love us, you know, they, they love to see reverts in the masjid and they love to approach you and talk to you. But like, you know, a lot of people say, ah, you know, you reverts, like, you know, you're so much better than us. SubhanAllah. That's so not true. That's so not true. Every single Muslim made a choice. Every Muslim made a choice. Every single... How many people do we know who are pe daughters or or sons of a scholar and they're off the deen. How many brothers and sisters do we know who are just who were raised in Islamic households but they're not practicing Muslims? Because they made a choice. They made a choice. So each and every single one of us chooses to worship Allah. Yeah, the river is no better than, than, than the born Muslim. As a matter of fact, actually, I think about like your days in secondary school where the options of halal are maybe limited. Or like there's that nice looking girl that you think is like not really attractive but you're a Muslim so you know the hellfire, you've got that torment of having to challenge your nafs. Even if you fell into something but you still had that torment, that emotional trauma of that inner conflict that you face. We didn't have that. We didn't have that. So you might have been struggling from the beginning. You guys had Ramadan at like 12, 11 years old. You know, so subhanAllah, like we look, we look up to you just like you look up to us. You know, we're all equal. And... Um, and yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, fortunately, again, alhamdulillah, we come from, uh, <laughs> we have a supportive family. Uh, I, I challenged my, I did have my challenges. Some of them I brought upon myself. You know, when you come into the deen, when you come into the deen, you're certain it's the haq, you're certain it's the truth. You want to call the people to it. And sometimes you call the people to it with, with a lot of zeal, a lot of energy. And uh, sometimes you, you have to use wisdom. You have to be patient. So, some, you know, sometimes, you, sometimes we bring it on ourselves. Sometimes we don't engage and discuss Islam with people in the manner and the etiquettes that we're supposed to discuss Islam with them. Sometimes we just like to argue. We like to show off how much knowledge we have. We have no intention of, of even believing this guy is going to accept Islam through what I teach him. No, it's just a matter just to show off what little we, in reality, what little we know. So, alhamdulillah, my mum's always been really supportive of me. My dad, well, my dad's my dad. He's an interesting character. There should be a film on him. Or why he would win a BAFTA or something, definitely. <laughs> He's a funny guy, man. Oh, my mum, mum was good though. Right? Yeah, mum was, was good. good. She, she, like even the other day, even the other day, yeah, I had don't to cut me off, man. Like, <laughs> 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 no, but she actually took her shahada, you know. She did. It's, it's a sensitive. It's a sensitive topic. So I, don't, I think that's maybe why I didn't say it because there's nothing great in taking your shahada and having no amal, having no actions to go with it. Um, but she did take her shahada actually. She took her shahada the same night my wife took her shahada. And I married her the same. I married my wife the same night. Alhamdulillah. But my mum did take her shahada. But unfortunately, um, maybe due to our own shortcomings in, in how we, our expectation levels and how we gave that, maybe that affected it, or just her being an older woman and struggling to implement some of these changes in lifestyle was maybe a bit too much for her. I remember her saying, you know, um, talking about giving dawah with wisdom. She was saying that she was upstairs in the sisters section, and some sisters told her about the nail varnish that she's got to take it off. You know, because of how wudu and that, so, you know, it's, um, there's no wudu, there's no salah, so I understand maybe, you know, it's important to mention these things, but we have to be sensitive and we have to be smart when we're giving dawah to people, but inshallah my mum returns back to the deen, alhamdulillah, she, I think she loves Islam really, she does, but she just lacks some understanding. Inshallah, inshallah.